welcome to another episode of Architect Tomorrow. Um, this one is going to be about where physical meets digital, uh, or rather digital mapping and geospatial, but we'll get on to all of that shortly. Um, as always with these podcasts, they aren't necessarily the official views of either of our employers. It's a personal podcast I run, um, so yes, um, don't, don't take anything as being, being official sort of views or opinions. Um, but one thing I will say is if you are enjoying this podcast, uh, please do um, tell your, your friends and colleagues and, and connections about it, how we sort of spread the, the, the community. Um, anyway, with, with that, Isabel, thanks very much for, for, for joining. Thank you for having me. Yeah, no, it's great. I mean, we had a great prep conversation, so yes. sometimes I almost wish I could hit the record button when <laughs> we do the prep calls, because sometimes some of the conversations are amazing. But perhaps if you could um, kick off with intros, and I guess before we get onto that, I have to say thank you to Sally Pritchard, who has made the introduction to yourself, and I think the pair of you met at, at, at Ornan Survey. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. She used to work here at Ornan Survey. Yeah. Uh, I think a few years ago, something right. like that. Right. We moved on, unfortunately, yeah. but uh, yeah, yeah, it's great she connected us. Yes. And so tell me about yeah about, about your role at, at Geovation. So I'm a business and innovation lead for Geovision, and Geovision is the innovation hub for Ornan Survey. So on and survey, people think about on and survey, paper map, yeah. you know, Boy Scouts, or <laughs> anyone running around uh, and hiking. Yeah. Um, but there's so much more to it than paper maps. Um, anything that is using kind of a, um, information and uh, ground information or space information uh, in GB is using generally on and surveys map as right. a background. Right. So think building footprint, think address, think uh, topo that is uh, underpinned by on and surveys right. data, right. Uh, which is amazing. And yeah. all that is obviously not in the form of paper map that we just run around with, but it's really about data that mm. is called in and then layered onto other sets, on, onto other data sets. Yeah. And we, Geovision, are the, the innovation hub, so we work, we use the data, but we really work with startups and we help startups and innovators use that data and create amazing solutions. Yeah. Now, I'm keen to, keen to get on to that, but before we do, I think your, your career journey into tech is quite interesting, right? Because um, the, pod, the particular podcast is called Architect Tomorrow, but it's very rare I actually speak to someone who is a proper, a proper building <laughs> architect, right? In the technology world, we get away with sort of slapping the architect title onto our jobs at a certain point of seniority. Um, but you can't just do that in the building world, right? There's like a seven-year degree and all that sort of stuff. So do, yeah. do, 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 just, do give the audience a bit of background on your career. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, it's um, interesting. So I have kind of a, an absolutely non-linear uh, career. So yeah. I started as an architect, uh, like a building, building architect. So I studied in Paris, uh, moved here, um, joined, uh, worked for quite a few companies, including Conrad and Partners and Foster and Partners. Right. Um, here in the UK, I worked on really exciting projects. It's always nice to walk around and see your buildings. Right. Uh, being, uh, you know, there, still there. So was the very axe one of the things that you were sort of, was that around the time you were there? No, okay. well, I wasn't working on that. I, okay. In Foster's, I was working on um, a project in Paris. Okay. Um, interesting, pro- in Paris and in kind of a suburb of Paris. Right. Uh, but in uh, at uh, Conran, I worked uh, on projects in uh, Manchester okay. and, and a bit spread out. Actually, uh, uh, quite a few restaurants in London as well. Um, so yeah, quite a quite a wide uh, thing. And I worked a lot on uh, mixed use, uh, residential, and also kind of fast paced uh, hospitality projects. So right. wide, and always from design to uh, implementation because. What I really like is the journey. Okay. So it's starting from the idea, and mm-hmm. kind of understanding the client, understanding the constraints, physical constraints, uh, planning constraints, time, financial, all these constraints, right. and transform that into something that is positive and that you can actually build, and go into the kind of a, the the building phase, which is really exciting. Mm. Um, so yeah, now it's a so from architecture. Right. Uh, I then set up my own company called Spin Architecture um, and worked with quite a few residential developers and, um, and other clients and decided that I wanted to go into more asset management. And to do that, you need to learn the language of financials, you know, financial language and to do that in the best way. 
I thought uh, I would do an MBA, which is what I did at London Business School, okay. which was a really interesting, interesting journey. First, right. you know, a lot of work, yeah, uh, but also a lot of understanding that there are transferable skills and transferable knowledge between architecture and the rest of. Uh, you know the world as architects we often kind of grow into our little bubbles <laughs> and we because of the amount of work and the amount of uh, uh, and how we probably are we kind of uh, we're a little bit you know kind of away from the rest of um the rest of uh, the uh, the different uh, work streams and i think it's interesting to see that you know there are lots of things that are actually transferable anyway bottom line is doing my mba made me realize two things a that um, i wanted to do something more impactful right and that i wanted to um get into tech right right because tech is like architecture, but on speed. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it takes it takes quite a while to put up a physical structure, right? I mean, the, the, exactly. the time between the planning and and, and, and building. Yeah, that's the exciting thing I think about tech is it's the yeah the kind of the um, fulfillment you get from seeing that thing realised. Because I I subscribe to that as well. Like seeing the thing through and seeing it happen is really satisfying, right? And the the feedback loop in technology is far faster. Exactly. Uh, yeah. And it's it's amazing. I mean, that's you know for me it was a realization that. Oh, you can actually do things, you know, do really exciting things. Yeah. Way faster, you right. can do more and mm -hmm. and also you don't have and um, kind of the flip side, you don't have the responsibilities and the risks, you know. And in architecture, if my risk or oh, the risk is, you know, the building falls, something kind of breaks and it's actually it yeah. can hurt people. Right, of course. Uh, think when fairly Yeah, 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 of course. Yeah. That are quite yeah. like, yeah. tragic. Yeah, yeah. In tech that's an interesting yes. point, and it's it's one I'm really keen to cover on the podcast at some point because I do quite a lot of work with ISA, which is the International Association of Software Architects, yeah. and um, Paul, um, who's a good friend of mine, and he's appeared on the podcast actually. He's really passionate about the fact that he thinks that technology architects get away with the fact that they don't hold that responsibility. Now, sure, some systems have very little downside risk, but if you're building medical systems or I you're agree. building systems that underpin Absolutely. critical infrastructure. This is why I made that slightly flippant comment at the beginning about we can just give ourselves the job title because there's quite a bit of debate at the moment about if for critical national infrastructure type things or things where the risk isn't trivial, should there be more certification, qualification? I think you're right. I think, it's, I think you're totally right in the fact that uh, you know, um, there, there's a need to have a bit more understanding of the risks. And yes, there are risks with tech. It's different from, a, from obviously from... A, physical, but, yeah. but they yeah. are still inherent, and they'll be more and more, because tech is... Becoming more ubiquitous, exactly. becoming more critical. Exactly. It's the thing, to start with, like the internet was almost just sort of this geeky thing that people sort of almost took fun of, people like, you're on the internet, what's that? You know, or yeah. people didn't understand it. Now it just, <clears throat> it just underpins everything, right? And we're layering upon layering. This is the thing, so I, I, I think that the, the unique and important skill and role that architects have is seeing that bigger picture and how things inter interlock and where the dependencies are. And there's this, um, I'll have to try and put the meme in, into the video, but there's this XKXD, I think, um, meme where there's all these kind of software components and they're all sort of held up by this one thin sort of thing <laughs> that like is at a risk of failing and then when that thing fails, you know, a lot of Single stuff... Single point has, of failure yeah. and everything comes yeah. down. Yeah, yeah. But, no, I, but I get your point about it, that there was there being less... It, yeah, it being less regulated and less constrained, I suppose. There's a lot more scope for innovation. Although I think governance is coming. I mean, like, clearly we've got lots of AI stuff. And we yeah. talk a lot about AI on the podcast. There's clearly going to be more regulation and rules coming because some of these things have more significant consequences, I guess. Yeah, but, and impact on the broader scale. Yeah, uh, yeah. Which is, I mean, it's, it is needed. So mm. it's a... It's a it's good that it's uh, actually happening. Right. But um, anyway, it's, it anyway. wasn't. It wasn't just for you know the risks. It's really because yeah. the ability of building uh, and creating at at pace and much faster, and also uh, different environment and different uh, objectives. 
So that's why I've, I've joined a um, social impact incubator. Okay. Um, and I created an ed tech startup, so a massive jump yeah. in a way that I had to learn uh, tech in a way, um, learn how to um, do products or tech, tech products, but also look at the a different um, a different area, which is education and uh, mental health. Okay. Um, mm. For young kids. Right. Uh, so it was really interesting. I've literally learned uh, incredibly mm. uh, during that time. It was interesting um, for not only for the for the for the learning, as in you know um, more kind of structured and academic learning, but it's really also learning about yourself and position. Putting you, you know, totally out of your comfort zone, incredibly out of the comfort zone, and finding yourself every day on the edge of the cliff and thinking, <laughs> "Oh, what am I doing?" <laughs> I think it's really interesting, isn't it, in your career when you go into a space where you're uncomfortable, and I, I think the people that succeed the most are the ones that are comfortable being uncomfortable because that's when you're growing and developing. And but it's it's difficult, isn't it, to sort of feel confident enough to sort of push the boundaries of what you can do as, a, as an individual. And so, yeah, how did, uh, how, what's the sort of role into current, what does the journey to current role look like? So, the, well, yeah. after my, uh, the startup I did, I wanted to, I realised that I wanted to stay within tech, okay. but I wanted to go slightly closer to my, not comfort zone, but to my core um, competency, core expertise, competencies, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and therefore, um, here is fantastic. Right. Duration here, we're in duration. Okay. That's why I'm yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's because it's literally kind of the, the combination of technology and property or property environment space, um, as in physical space. Mm-hmm. So not purely building, but you know the the whole environment, and that's those two kind of combined together in uh, you know in uh, this great place. Right. <laughs> and that's why I, why I'm here. Yeah. So tell me more about Geovation then. So it's it, it's Ordnance Survey sort of innovation hub. As I walked in, it looked like the sort of space where maybe startups could kind of co-incubate sort of yeah. things. With, yeah, absolutely. So it was created in 2009. At the yeah. time, uh, Ordnance Survey wanted to open the data to innovators. Okay. And it was extremely, you know, it, it was unheard of at right. the time, really. Okay. So it was for, for a company that size and this type of company it was a really a gigantic leap in yeah. the future. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they opened the data initially ad hoc, so really on more around innovation challenges, so, okay. uh, which are you know understanding a problem space and then opening it to innovators to come up with solutions. Mm-hmm. Um, and since, it, since then it's evolved and into physical space with right. startups and the okay. startups coming and joining a community. Yeah. So we have a community of about 2,000 innovators kind of across the country. And um, and we also have three accelerator streams. So accelerator, we take startups, early stage startups, and we help them kind of uh, uh, work on a proof of concept, MVP, yeah. and, and then uh, kind of grow and scale. And um, the three accelerators are one are focusing is focusing on geotech, so yeah. startups that use location data. And when okay. we say location data, it's kind of the broader location data. So it includes um, also earth observation data, I'm pointing right. towards the sky because it's satellite. Yeah, 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 satellite. Data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So a lot of satellite or aerial imagery. So it's really about kind of the broader location data. Mm. We have one in um, partnership with the uh, Land Registry, okay. HM Land Registry, which is focusing on prop tech. Right. Um, so property technology, yes. I think that is uh, in that field. And okay. then there's one in Scotland, which is with Registers of Scotland, and which is focusing on geotech and prop tech, but in Scotland. Right. Um, so from for startups that are based in Scotland. So it's really covering you know anything that you can see around you right. is uh, right. is. So we're talking sort of utilities, infrastructure, sort of pipes, plumbing, you know, that sort of everything, especially from buildings, but also the infrastructure that supports those sort of buildings. That but sort of even more, mm. you know, the, the breadth of what we cover is quite, uh, it's quite astounding, and that's okay. and that what is so thrilling about it. Because there's so many possibilities. Exactly, yeah. and you know, the data you can use the data in so many different ways. Mm. So. Um, 
everything is absolutely underpinned by our data, so yeah. US data, but other yeah. data sets as well, and LR data as well. So if you're looking at, you know, in the property part, we have startups that work on the home buying uh, principles, some okay. uh, working on leaseholds, right. some working on uh, reusing uh, material for buildings that are going to be demolished. Okay, so like circular uh, economy for building materials, that exactly. sort of stuff. Okay. So we have, so we really have like a, mm. a lot of different startups that cover a wide breadth of um, options in the um, uh, in the geospatial so geotech stream. We have startups working obviously on infrastructure, uh, improving the grid or working with the with um, electricity grid. We also have started working with. Um, biodiversity net gain so you know what has been I don't know if I mean there's a new legislation that has just been implemented on the 12th of Feb okay uh, which is a really interesting legislation and quite groundbreaking right uh, which is um, saying that any new build and any new uh, development um, has to uh, look at the biodiversity of the site is building okay. on right. a part of the planning permission and it has to make sure that it's not going to hinder or kind of um, diminish the biodiversity right looking at it on a span of 30 years oh wow okay so it's a really interesting very very interesting right. um, legislation but planners are not tooled for Mm. Understanding, well, not mm. understanding but so there's an area of innovation to kind of create solutions for people to think about those exactly. biodiversity impacts and right. measure it and make yeah. sure that they can go to you know meet the legislation mm. at the moment the legislation is great but you need to have the tools to be able to yeah you know um, yeah. and and we see that in lots of startups that legislation is very often a driver for innovation you know it's when you put constraints and when you put kind of a a stick and a yeah. carrot <laughs> that's an innovation comes in yeah uh, and you know it's, it's great so bng it's so a biodiversity net gain is very much one of these uh, kind of drivers of innovation um, but again yeah we have startups uh, working on um, on uh, the quality of soil uh, some that would be working on marketplaces uh, either for um, for retrofit of housing, okay. but also for um, food companies that want to source uh, low emission uh, meat or low emission products. So right. it's really, you know. Yeah, well, that's the beautiful thing, I suppose, about, and we should probably rewind a second and talk about what geotech and geospatial are for people that haven't heard those terms before. But that is the beauty of location data. And I've, I've dipped in and out of this world a few times. I started off in local government my career, so I was fair amount putting planning applications online and that required sort of, you know, spatial data and, and, and so on. Um, but of course, this can underpin so many different things because as I started at the beginning, this is the technology that helps us bring the physical world, you know, in, 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 into life. And I guess there's a slightly cheesy um, sort of tech term, digital twins at the moment. I, I, uh. I'm not a massive <laughs> fan of it, but I think yeah. geospatial is a, class, is, a, is a great example of that. But right? it's, it's about mapping out the physical world you know, digitizing it and kind of creating databases and data sets around, um, around uh, yeah, kind of the geography or yeah, the geo, I guess, comes from the ge geography part, right? Yeah, absolutely. Spatial as in space. So, yeah. But how would, how would you describe geospatial and, and geotech for someone that hasn't, hasn't come across this field before? So geotech is very much a made-up world that okay. we, we've made up. Okay. And, uh, and not a lot of people necessarily understand it. I've not heard it before uh, we had a conversation, actually. I've heard of geospatial, but not geotech. Yeah. Yeah. But I think we wanted to kind of look at how we could, um, you know, put a name towards startups that use uh, a specific type of data, which is geospatial data. Right. The geospatial data being location data. So anything, you know, everything happens somewhere. Yeah. So yeah. very much, you know, in loads of startups, if you take your phone uh, up on it, you'll find loads of your apps are actually using location yeah. data. Yeah. You know, not just the Ubers of this world. But almost or, everything. But almost mm. everything has mm. got a location yeah. uh, to it. Because it can be used for targeting advertising, I guess. Absolutely. Yeah. So it can be either, you know, visible or mm. kind of running in the background, but it has got location data. So what we are focusing on is startups that use location data more, not so much as a kind of background work, but more as a core element. That's the main thing, yeah. But it's not like, you know, prop tech is, is clearer because it's property. Mm. Insure tech, well, insurance, it's yes. easy. Yes, yes. Um, 
geotech is more around you know the use of geospatial data and therefore can cover a wide range of applications. Yeah, and I guess a lot of people when they think of geospatial probably go straight to maps like Google Maps or or, exactly. or, or surveys mapping sort of products. But there's as you said there's all that, there's all that hidden sort of geospatial stuff that goes on behind the scenes and uh, you know kind of planning out where infrastructure companies should run cabling and fiber optic cables or, or your or your um, water or gas or whatever you know so all this stuff is super important isn't it in terms of like mapping out the physical world at a level of precision that allows for I guess it's a bit like the surveying you know of, of streets and so on it's 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 all that sort of hidden stuff that we don't realize goes on but it's so critical to, and underpins so much of the real world right uh, and absolutely and that's why you know it's a it's um a lot of our startups might be geotech because we call them geotech, mm -hmm. but they'll be agri-tech or okay. they'll be insure tech. In the, in the reality is they'll be yes. agri-tech. But they use elements of geotech. Exactly. Right. But, they, right. but they use geospatial data. Mm -hmm. um, if I'm talking, you know, if I think about a startup working on soil uh, quality, uh, they're more of an agri-tech startup. Yes. But they need to understand, you know, where the soil, uh, they, they'll be mapping out uh, all the farmers' lands and understand where the soil quality is and what you know, what type of quality where, and that will be absolutely underpinning what they do. If they don't have that, they don't have a company. So and it's such a relevant um, space to be in right now, right? Because everyone, well, hopefully everyone, not quite everyone. <laughs> I think a lot of people are starting to wake up to realise that the natural world, we've been undervaluing the natural world, right? And so a lot of this technology allows us to kind of get quite precise about air quality, soil quality, water quality. It just lets us look at that physical world that we unfortunately sometimes you know, don't value as much as we should and start, to your point about biodiversity you were talking about earlier. So is it, it, can you talk to me about any other more other exciting projects in that space that you've kind of seen recently? Is that... Because I'm always looking for good news stories. So there's so much doom and gloom around, you know, the kind of planet, right? And it, it, it's it's tricky. But what, yeah, what, I guess what's excited you recently in this sort of geotech space applied to sustainability and and improving sort of natural outcomes? So I think the um, satellites right. at the moment. Uh, there's a plethora of new satellites um, looking at hyperspectral data, so looking at more in-depth data and more different type of data, okay. which means we can, from space, uh, learn a lot uh, and look at kind of down on Earth and look at, uh, you know, very interesting things around biodiversity, again, around, um, you know, deforestation, mm. we can look mm. at. Uh, so all these are, th they're, they're really a driver for n innovation. Right. Um, obviously, because it is available, there's a lot of um, kind of competition in right. this field, right. which is great because yeah, yeah. it means something will come out mm. and will actually deliver value to people. You mentioned hyperspatial and Earth observation, and I think it's worth talking about some of those things because, again, terms that people won't necessarily have come across before. I mean, Earth observation clearly at a very simplistic level, is what allows Google Maps to show a satellite view of the world, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm assuming hyperspatial is also, sorry, um, hyperspectral, Spectral, sorry, yeah. hyperspectral, is looking at other frequency wavelengths like infrared and ultraviolet and yes. other things like that to tell you different things about the land that the satellite is pointing now and looking at? Absolutely. Okay. So until recently, we would have images that would be RGB, so like pure images like... Visible, images. visible light that we can exactly. see. Exactly. Yeah. Which would be limiting what we could do with mm -hmm. that, with them. Obviously, there's a lot you can do, yeah. but it is quite limiting. And now with uh, uh, new satellites and a uh, different uh, type of uh, radars coming, um, you can have hyperspectral. So I'm not an expert, so I'm not going to... No, 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 it's fine. Let's keep, keep it high level. <laughs> but, but it, is, it's, it gives different layers of information that can yeah. be treated, and therefore we can extract more information and do more with and also, obviously, the resolution mm. is higher. Yeah. There are loads of microsatellites as well, which okay. are uh, giving different you know, time uh, lines, so they, they don't come necessarily at the same time. So there's frequency, there's uh, resolution, and there's bandwidth, uh, which is increasing massively right. the amount of imagery and data we can work with. Obviously, all this needs to be kind of uh, working with geo, because an image without a map mm. is... Well, it's just mm, meaningless yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So you need to layer always, yeah. uh, you know, kind of a 
uh, geospatial mm. information onto mm -hmm. images and yeah. earth observation uh, because it's important to be able to understand you know, how you can position things. But, but there are really interesting things on the heat data, so ground, right. um, ground heat data, understanding, you know, heats of coming out of buildings, but mm -hmm. not just buildings, also realizing that it might be, um, you know, the astroturf on schools that is actually reflecting more heat right. Uh, right. over buildings. So yeah. it's, it then kind of lead to, you know, um, resiliency and planning and adaptation. I was going to say, as we kind of move into a world where unfortunately we have to start adapting, this data is going to be critical for us to understand what stupid things like what colours should we be painting buildings or roofs you know, exactly. to reflect or, or, or where should we put solar you know, um, panels and so on and so forth because we can kind of get that data from the sky that tells us these things. And it's exactly what's happening. Now we need to bear in mind that the downside of satellites is mm. between satellites and us, mainly here, clouds. <laughs> yeah, so I was going to mention that. <laughs> yeah. And therefore, yeah. you know, it's... It, it all sounds like, you know, it seems like an easy thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. I imagine, oh, yeah. great, I can see everything. It's not the case. No, no. no you, yeah, it's not easy. Well, today is not such a bad day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Uh, but it's not, uh, it's not such an easy thing to, mm. you know, to make sure that you have consistent data that you right. can actually use. And uh, so there's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. It might be easier in some countries to use satellite data because of the cloud coverage. Right. Here, not as easy. Mm. Yet, uh, it's, a, it's a great source of yeah. uh, new data that we can use, uh, and it's important to, you know, to use it. Uh, it doesn't, you know, there's the layer in between, which would be aerial, so yeah. planes flying around, yes. uh, is still a great layer because we can fly under the sky. Cloud, the, the and therefore cover. have a better coverage, but the cost is different, and so you, you know. I'm guessing drones play into this now as well, do they? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So we have quite a few startups that look at uh, 3D mapping, so not necessarily digital twinning, right? But <laughs> um, 3D mapping buildings, looking again at, with the lidar data, so with yeah. uh, with a, with a, um, with radars uh, to understand the heat coming out of buildings, so there's a lot happening again right. in that field, um, which is, you know, uh, generated and by new technology like drones, but also yeah. by uh, the ability to process more data and uh, process it at speed with uh, better uh, machine learning. Yes, yes. So, of course, everyone's talking about machine learning at the moment. Yeah. And so... Um, do you think we're going to start to see some sort of generative AI model for geospatial coming? Is that, is that is there something in, already in the works? There's there's a lot of work on that, mm. um, and uh, we uh, we're obviously exploring. We're talking, you know, lots of startup try in different ways to right. look at it and use uh, generative AI. Um, it can be used, you know, either by kind of a plugin or using. You know the chat GPTs of this yeah, world, yeah. Uh, but <coughs> but it's also um, you know, it's how do you really inter interrogate maps right. uh, with uh, geospatial? Yeah, it feels like that's going to be something at some point. Um, I mean, we've seen recently Google bring out Graphcast, which is look, looking at bringing predictive models to weather yes. forecasting, which. I mean, it's quite staggering when you look at it because the amount of energy that's required to do the high-performance compute to calculate the weather is, is quite staggering. So actually, everyone talks about AI models using all this power. That's one example where we might actually use less, less power by using a, a machine learning model, which is reversed to the trend of, of using all this energy. But I do think there are going to be some fascinating applications for, for it in, in, in this space. And maybe it will democratise and make geospatial more easy, right? Because right now, I guess... It is quite a niche field. You need to understand, you know, the kind of the data sets, the terminology, and so on. I suppose if you had something that just sort of a bit like right now, you can say to the chatbot, "Can't you write me some Python code?" Yeah. I'm guessing we aren't far away from, you know, chatbot. Can you create me a 3D shape or a plot or a, you know, something that would be you know, that can't that can't be that far away. Uh, absolutely, yeah. and I think there's you know there are quite a few people working on right. that. Right, right, right. But it's like everything, you know. How much do you want to work on it to? Uh, or how much you want to protect your mm. kind of a you yeah. Know, yeah 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 yeah, you know, yeah yeah create barriers to to keep your <laughs> talking of barriers and moats. Um, what's your sort of take on open source? Because I guess 
clearly Ordnance Survey has a huge amount of intellectual property. You know, it's 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 expensive to maintain the, the topography mapping and all that yeah. sort of stuff, right? So there's a real asset there that Ordnance Survey has. But what's what's the geovation stance, I suppose, on sort of open source? Are you starting to open up parts of the data sets or how is that kind of looking for, for you? So some of the data sets are open to um, innovators okay. and uh, up to a certain point. So yeah. it's kind of a play area. Right, like a sandpit. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. a sandpit where, um, where innovators and it's encouraged by OS and that's the reason for why Jewishian was created. Right, a way of managing that, that sort of process. Exactly. Yeah. And so if you go onto the data hub where you can access OS data, uh, there's a num, you know, there's kind of a freemium uh, part okay. where you can you can play with the data, right. which is great because that's how you learn and yeah. understand and how you can see how you can embed it into your solutions. Mm. Um, but obviously, you know, we are a limited company. Yes. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you know, and as you say, uh, the data. I mean, the quality of our data is amazing. Yes. Um, the authoritativeness and the maintenance of it mm. is amazing as well mm-hmm. as gigantic. So that has a cost. Yeah. Yeah. To yeah. It. So obviously, you know, there's there's a point where we want people to use it. Mm. Uh, people recognize the value of it. Right. Uh, but we need to we need to make sure that it's uh, it's a we're sustainable. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> yes, because this is because financial viability is as much of a part of sustainability as, as anything else as people who listen to the podcast know that I, I I talk about holistic sustainability in the round. So no absolutely agree. Um, fascinating. Well, look, we've covered we've covered a lot of ground there. I guess we've talked about the sort of potential and the opportunities. I I also kind of like to put my uh, worst case scenario hat on at times and sort of think about the risks and the challenges. And I suppose I, I guess as we get more, uh, yeah, we talked about you touched on location information being used in apps on people's phones and perhaps people not being fully aware of that. There's clearly sort of some increasing perhaps privacy concerns around around all this mapping. Yeah. Do you think that's do you, do you think that's kind of a major barrier to sort of innovation? Is there sort of a I guess what I'm trying to say is how do we sort of tread that fine line? I suppose between encouraging innovation around location information and ensuring sort of people's safety and privacy. Is that something that that some of the people you work with are? <coughs> yeah, I'm guessing that's something that's sort of front of mind. There is very much front mm. of mind, and there's a lot of um, kind of thinking happening on that um, because it is recognised throughout, and all the kind of um, you know uh, agencies around uh, geographic information recognise that there is need to look at how the data is being uh, treated right. and right. Um, and how we can protect. Uh, not just citizens, but generally, mm. the data mm. is sensible. It's, it's very sensitive data. The point on the survey was created about two hundred and whatever forty years ago, because of the fear of the French. Oh, okay, and, that's <laughs> ironic. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and you know, it's a, it's it's defence based. Yes, you know, hence the name ordnance, right? Exactly. It's less munitions. Um, yeah, I guess it's, it's. I guess initially was. Surveying for, for artillery, uh, exactly. I'm, I'm assuming, yeah. Exactly, yeah. and they are. They were until uh, recently. Still, you know, the, the things were mapped on. You know, how many horses can we hide behind that? It's interesting to be able to to map it. You know, because the horses can be uh, hidden, right. or you know, a ditch needs to be counted as you can put a man behind it, and you can. So it's right. it was really right. related to military. Right. Obviously, things have evolved. Yeah, of course. Uh, but, yeah, yeah. Um, but that's his heritage. Yeah. But it's coming from that, so it is sensitive. Yeah, and there's, there's, and, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, and as we go and as we kind of grow and develop and as the data is more and more available, um, as you say, that you know, there's there are sensitivities that are being recognised, and it's at kind of a more country level, higher level. Well, there's there's quite a funny example of that. I don't know if you saw in the news the talk this week about BT Tower being sold. I don't know if you saw the amusing anecdote that for a long time the location of BT Tower was a subject to the Official Secrets Act, which I just think is hilarious, right? Because it's the most one of the most <laughs> obvious things in London, yet because of its role in sort of communication infrastructure in the event of, you know, a, 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 God forbid, a nu- 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 nuclear war or, or, or some kind of major crisis, that, yeah, its location was an official secret, which is just... But it's just an example of the sorts of things that sit in 
this data right. There are sensitive sites for government and military re reasons. I mean, I remember when I was building um, many years ago, and I was building a tool to help permitted development for small wind turbines. We were given highly sensitive shape files of exclusion zones in in the UK where people were not going to be permitted to put up wind turbines because it could affect radars for civil reasons, for military reasons, you know, or other 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 sort of critical infrastructure. So. You know, there are clearly sensitive data sets out there that have to be protected. So I, to I, to I totally get that. Um, but yeah, no, it's so it's so it's fascinating. It's this. It's it's one of these things that I think unless you spend a bit of time looking at it, there's all this stuff going on that that yeah you know, that helps run the world, but you don't really yeah you know, until you dig into it, you don't really understand. Exactly. Yeah. And that, for me, that has been really a discovery. So mm. coming from architecture, where it's more building, you know, it's yeah. more localized. Uh, I've always, uh, you know, been really interested in urban, so kind of the broader. Yeah. But for me, it's even kind of a one step uh, further in in the discovery that you know this has got such an impact, and you can't ignore it. And it's actually, yeah. you know, underpinning most yeah. of the things you're doing. So. Yeah. But it's because it's funny in a world that's increasingly becoming digital, and I suppose we're slightly ig not ignoring, but becoming abstracted, I suppose, from day to day physical life. It, it, it's this counterweight that says actually the physical world is really, really important and how we manage it and optimise it and plan and, and all that sort of stuff. The, the, this, is, this is critical to that. And I guess at some point this world will probably collide into the digital world when, and I'm very cynical, I suppose, about metaverse. Yeah, but exactly. and digital <laughs> <We're in meta. laughs> But I guess at some point, you know, the, this, the, the, your, 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 your innovation hub here will potentially support the ability to kind of Create uh, worlds where we're able to sort of explore the, the, the physical world, like in a, in, a, in a virtual reality setting. Which I know some people are kind of. It, it, I had a really interesting discussion actually with someone uh, earlier this week about should we be creating sort of natural experiences of artificially? Because surely we should just be valuing nature in the first place. Okay. So yeah. it, it creates a lot of really interesting sort of discussions about. Yeah, the kind of I suppose the nature of the physical world being made virtual and vice versa. Yeah, no, I agree. I think you know, obviously, the 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 physical world we can't remove ourselves no, from it. No, even yet. though sometimes I think we feel like we can, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, but there's definitely a question around you know the the ability to uh, duplicate and mm. without using digital twin. Yeah, but I would say more duplicate or replicate uh, elements of uh, the physical world. In yeah. The, in a more virtual world. Um, interesting, we, we don't have so many startups working on that. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting thing. I think mm. we have more startups that are working on the current physical world. Yes. Uh, of uh, startups that uh, are. But it's probably the trend has kind of yes. passed a bit. You're right. I think it's these things go in waves, don't they? And exactly. the metaverse has kind of had its time, and I'm sure it will come back in a few years and it'll be much, much better than the clunky version that, 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 that we've sort of experienced um, up to this point. Um, it's a bit like machine learning, right? That's kind of gone in waves, like exactly. as we've discovered it can do something new, that unlocks yeah. new use cases. So, yeah. For me, there are one of, you know, there's one question, Web3, for example, mm, mm. is something that I see loads of potential connections with geospatial, but there's nothing, no one's really looking into it. The and semantic sort of properties, I yes. think is really, really interesting. Like, yeah, I, I, what's really frustrating me about Web3 actually is that the the over-indexing on crypto and virtual exactly. reality. Actually, if you take the date, the linked data concept of Web3 and decentralization and all that sort of stuff, there's some really interesting concepts there. And I think you're right. I think like spatial data and, sem and sort of semantically linking things together would unlock a whole bunch of things. And ironically, the current machine learning models and the large language models work even better when they have that sort of rich data to sort of work with. Absolutely, and that's why for me there's there is a space there. Mm. But as you said, crypto has kind of distracted everyone. Killed the web. Th well, not killed, but I mean it's, it's kind of put Web three into into a space. Yes. That uh, is yeah a different space from a. Just well, well, what my view was is that Web three was kind of hijacked somewhat by the yeah. crypto movement. And it was, I was somewhat annoyed because it's like, how can you claim a version number of the web, right, as, your, as, as, as yours? Stop it. Uh, because the internet, the web will evolve, right? Um, and I'm sure that the next version will have more, I'm fairly comfortable, have more semantic sort yeah. of, I mean, semantic web has quietly 
been bubbling away. I mean, yeah. like, most people I don't think realise when you do a Google search and you get the information box on the right-hand side about a company or a brand or something that you've searched for, all of that is semantic web data. You yeah. know, and Wikipedia has obviously got a lot of that in it. And there's all these rich data sets. And I think when we start connecting these things up, that's when we'll get real Web3. I think yeah. it's, it's when we get that kind of almost... Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But, yeah, I think, you know, it needs to kind of... A, Remove itself from the crypto world, and uh, and uh, get into kind of the broader world. Yeah, and that's for me. That's uh, I see you know real potential there. Right. That is yet unexplored. Okay. Or as as far as I know, I don't see yeah. the startups working on right. it. Right. Um, and mainly again with you know the the amount of data that is being um, produced yeah. by you know Earth Observation and other data sets that we can. Create. And the importance of this data is the maintenance, right. the accuracy, yep. and the capacity to have it. You know, the authoritativeness of that mm. data mm. is absolutely key. Well, otherwise it can't be trusted, and therefore exactly. it's not useful. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. So, um, Isabel, the the podcast is called Architect Tomorrow. So, I like to try and sort of wrap things up and sort of try and conclude with talking about tomorrow. But you have already spoken a lot about what we can perhaps see in the future, but. If I could put you on the spot and maybe ask you for the sort of two or three things that you think are the future of the sort of geotech or geospatial space, what what would you where would you put your money? Uh, I'd put my money on well, I would definitely put my money generally on mm. geospatial because I think the world is uh, realizing the need for geospatial, uh, moving away from kind of tables and Excel. No, right. You know, Excel is right. great. Yeah. But uh, but the visualization, the ability to put things into context. And the systemic approach mm. is extremely important. Yeah. And that's what geospatial can allow you to do. Right. So, you know, there are elements like uh, ECB paper, so the European Central Bank paper, saying that risk needs to be assessed using geospatial. It's actually clearly stated. Interesting. Um, so, for the first time, it's, it is actually stated and it's actually, you know, called that as a need mm. uh, for you know banks and other financial institutions so it's it's there to stay I think it is obviously it's been there forever not forever but for a very long time uh, but it is there to be more embedded into thinking and as a tool as well of communication right. it's an easier tool to communicate you know people if you tell people uh, somewhere in the country this and this is happening uh, is very different than putting a map and telling them, look, this is happening here, you're here, you know, this... The power happen. of virtualization. Exactly. Yes. So it, it actually ticks a lot of boxes, you know. Right. Right. So I see a great future okay. yeah, 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 <laughs> for yeah. geospatial. Yeah. Um, and obviously, you know, the, as I mentioned, uh, it is also backed by new data sets mm. that are coming from... Uh, from um, satellite data. Yeah. Um, that is, you know, being... Um, uh, satellite data that we get more of. So, Earth observation definitely feels like we've just scratched the surface, right? So, yeah. you know, I really like what you're saying here. I, 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 I agree. I think the the fact that the world has become very over well, over indexed on digital to a degree, and it feels like this is the thing that can kind of bring digital and connect it back to the physical world in such a so data driven, right, you know, and relationship driven manner. And I, and I definitely do agree that, yeah, the days of just looking at things in Excel tables without relationship back to physical properties, those days are surely fairly numbered with, with all the global challenges and natural challenges that we face. So that's really interesting. And the power of, like you said, the power of visualising um, and then the power of space technology, which I think a lot of people don't realise quite how powerful and exactly. how much data is being gathered from, from yeah. satellites now. So I think there's yeah. a, there's kind of this uh, the the issue of the Hollywood effect okay. where people think you know oh you know I'm here and I can control everything from my little satellite <laughs> and I can zoom in and I can see that it's not bad right I'm not there right but uh, yet there's a lot of satellite there there mm. are a lot of satellites mm. in space more micro satellites there's a you know it is increasing drastically and um, therefore the amount of data. That can be used is greater, and it's uh, and it will unlock a lot of potential. Yeah. So one final thought for me is, you know, coming back to sort of open standards, it does feel like all this stuff links to sort of location 
it's super, super important. And how do we sort of agree on sort of a common standard? Are there standards already? Do you see sort of sort of standards forming? Because that feels like that's quite an important sort of enabler for collaboration and interoperability. Yeah, interoperability yeah. is like the main. Right. <laughs> I think it's 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 in the making. Mm. There are standards. There's a lot of talk. There's a lot of work. OS does a lot of work to uh, to you know uh, work with kind of generic stakeholders uh, around the world to, yeah. use, to look at that. So we are very much you know in that in those discussions. Uh, it's in the making. It's like everything. You know it. It is happening, yeah. but you know, diverse stakeholders, diverse needs. <laughs> and, and I guess there's, we've got a legacy here of sort of quite, a, 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 yeah, we obviously have paper maps and then we had early GIS systems and some of those are now quite old, legacy formats, proprietary. Yeah. So we now have, we almost have these layers of, of stra- the archaeological strata, yeah, right? Paper, of, of like, you know, paper mapping of, of early databases, yeah. and now we have Earth observation and, and real time sort of like internet things data. Exactly. We almost have these layers, don't we? And if, if you're an organization that's had any sort of longevity in this space, you'll have all those different sort of data sets. And then we kind of move into a future world with, as I say, geotech sort of startups coming on board. How they then sort of interoperate is, is going to be sort of fascinating. But I guess for most people in this space, particularly government departments, They've got this sort of legacy, haven't they? This history of of of, of, of uh, you know, massive amounts of data uh, in different formats. Yeah. So yeah, no, it's it, for me, it's fascinating. I think there's there's a it's it's always been one that's been really interesting, and it's clearly uh, a specialist space. But I think it's one that people would do well to understand a little bit about, particularly in the architecture profession, right? Because I think it's going to get more and more important to have the ability to do spatial. Um, aspects to your systems absolutely absolutely yeah. it yeah. can't be ignored yeah. I think I think it's really part of the future mm. uh, in most cases I mean obviously there will always be applications that uh, yeah. don't necessarily need that right. but generally I think it has to be yeah. it, it does underpin a lot mm-hmm. of what is happening so yeah brilliant so. fantastic Isabel well this has been a great conversation as I suspect it would be um, thanks again to Sally for putting us in, in touch yeah, with each other. And um, look, if you found this interesting, please do uh, please do, do subscribe. Do let me know if there are topics that you'd like uh, Architect Tomorrow to kind of cover. If you want to get involved, we sometimes do meetups and stuff like that, either virtual or in person. So, um, yeah, it's great stuff. Well, look, thanks again. Thank you. It was and, a pleasure. Great. And I hope to get you maybe on, a, on another one in the future with maybe yeah, some others. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Brilliant. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much.